Hello and welcome to the Mountain Gazette Library. I'm John Bustar, and this week we proudly present the writings of Norman McLean, professor, renowned writer, fisherman, and all-around outdoorsman. Enjoy. Enjoy the great American West. What's left of it? October on top of Half Dome. The whole Sierra was blanketed with a foot of snow. On. I had just entered a pleasantly empty subway car. And the next thing you know, you're in this calm, calm water. When you know who you are, when you get in touch with yourself, you don't have choices. So I think as a journalist right now, you have a lot of opportunity to really put across quality work that will stand out in a sea of a lot of garbage. If I've learned anything about life balance, it would be that the no balance balance is where it's at. (laughs) Episode 6, Retrievers, Good and Bad, by Norman McLean, from Mountain Gazette, 194. The day I was born, as I was often to be told, my father gave me a dog for my birthday present. Very early in life, then, I was to learn about the power of odd coincidence because my dog turned out to be a duck dog and my father turned out to be a duck hunter. And evidently, at least in my infancy, I did not resemble a duck and the dog did not give a damn about me. We talked painfully about father and mother rejections, but if you're going in for rejections, there is nothing like being the supposed infant owner of an animal and wanting to be loved by it and instead being studied by yellow eyes that wished you were a dead duck. Even so, in many ways and for long periods of the year, the dog belonged more to my mother than my father or to me. My father was a Scotch Presbyterian minister. He was intellectual and somewhat political and referred to Methodists as Baptists who could read. He thought he was fulfilling his calling by preaching two very good sermons on Sunday and by baptizing, marrying, and burying the local Americans of Scotch descent on weekdays. The so-called church work he regarded as women's work. And so it was my mother who visited the new members of the church and ran the ladies' aid and Christian endeavor and tried to sing louder than anyone else in the congregation. My father's ideas about a duck dog were highly specialized. He expected the dog to be totally his from the opening morn of duck season until the closing sunset. During the remaining portion of the year, he expected the dog to be taken care of, as the church was, by God and by my mother. But in the case of the dog, God, with some justification, left the work to my mother. So she fed the dog all year until hunting season. She combed and brushed it. She saw that the dog had a good bed and clean bedding. She even watched more closely than my father the coming date of the opening of the duck season. A month before, she would confine the dog to the garage because she knew my father was not unique among mankind in expecting to have a duck dog on opening day, even though he hadn't taken care of it until then. Any dog resembling a duck dog Any dog, even with yellow eyes, could not venture alone on the street of my town two weeks or even a month before the opening of the season without being not exactly stolen, but abducted until November 30th. So my mother locked up the dog, and then, of course, she had to walk it. My mother was a fine working woman, but she had one shortcoming. She ran the church and all that. She had a family to take care of, and she was a stable boy, as it were for a succession of large female Chesapeake Bay retrievers. But she was not a dog trainer, and my father, on the opening day of duck season, expected not only a well-fed and well-kept dog, but a perfect retriever. Since he would not train the dog himself, it may be difficult to understand just how he expected them to show instantaneous perfection. But this is what he expected of hunting dogs and firstborn sons. My father's interest in the dog business was more theological than scientific. So if a dog did not approach perfection, we got another Chesapeake Bay Retriever for the next season. They were always called Fanny, a name I did not like, and the dog never particularly liked me, but my father always said they were mine. This process went on after I left home 
and included dogs that I practically never saw. But it is easy to understand how in over 30 years, I came to own a kennel, as it were, of almost duck dogs. And even one dog that on her own power approached perfection. Then finally, there was the dog that was not given to me. I realized that my father and my town were fairly special. It's a good guess that something like what went on in my town went on in most small towns that were near shooting water. Universal pulsations seem to spread among ducks and dog hunters alike. It is said that far north in Canada, in the marshes where the ducks nest, you can hear increasing restlessness both day and night, some weeks before the migration begin, even if there is no visible signs of the storm that finally set the ducks off. And at the same time, south of the border, there is a stirring all along Main Street when something like a duck dog, even a cocker spaniel, goes by. Doors flutter open, sales are postponed, and customers and salesmen alike, especially hardware salesmen who sell shotgun shells, come out on the walk and suddenly become dog fanciers. It is almost a sure bet, too, that not one of the dogs, even those with good bloodlines, is well trained. It takes time to train a dog, summertime, and in summertime, the duck hunters and hardware salesmen I knew went fishing, including, of course, my father, who even tied his own flies. Come autumn, a dog hasn't much choice but to rely on his blood, which, given my experience, is never quite enough. The almost duck dog whose genetic deficiencies aroused my father most was Fanny number two. By the time I acquired title to her, we had moved to Western Montana, where there was excellent duck shooting and where for the first time my father was tempted to shoot over his legal limit. Accordingly, he started taking me with him. Although I was scarcely as long as a cast off double barrel shotgun I kept stumbling over, not half so powerful, at least in reverse. Naturally, my father didn't take me along to shoot ducks. I was too young to have to buy a license and all the ducks over the 20 he shot, 20 was the limit then, I was given to carry. They were mine, along with the dog. The dog, when I try honestly to remember, looked like any other Chesapeake Bay Retriever. Big, with brown curly hair, yellow eyes, intelligent, professional. We were shooting in the outlet of the lake. Quiet water covered with dead reeds, stuff that looked to me like seaweed and muck of that sort. Every time my father dropped a bird in the water, Fanny number two would charge out and swimming high would shoulder the dead duck aside and four or five feet beyond snap a mouthful of floating seaweed. She had a passion for seaweed and with an almost sexual smile on her face, she would return it to my father. Then, still standing right in front of him and still untrained, she would shake all the water out of her coat, most of which he had to absorb. After a while, he asked me if I could take my clothes off and swim for the ducks. And I did, but I hated it. It was all kind of marshy stuff and I had to pull my legs through the ooze a foot or more deep, dragging bubbles behind me. And when I swam, I could feel things touching my body. I was exhausted by the end of the day and hoped that my father would soon get rid of the dog. It wasn't the dogs retrieving seaweed that was sacrilege to my father. It was her pushing the dead duck aside. You can be sure that it was the only day we ever hunted with Fanny number two. I tend to remember best the almost duck dogs that enraged my father most. One made him swear, the only time I ever heard him do so. This Fanny was rather late in the succession. And by the time I acquired ownership, I was going with a girl whose home was in Wolf Creek, which is only a few miles from the Missouri River and not too far from its headwaters. Even there, it is a big river and looks as big or even bigger than it does six or 700 miles further down. It is still clear, but it is powerful and full of undercurrents and big bends against cliffs. 
It was just below the fabled canyon named the Gates of the Mountains by Lewis and Clark. My father had hunted several seasons with this dog and evidently had found her satisfactory. But he had hunted with her in the quiet, oozy outlet where seaweed drifts that I had described earlier. Well, there is no seaweed drifting on the big Missouri where we were shooting. The Missouri is one of the main flyways for ducks in America. And when the autumn storms begin in the north, the ducks come whistling out of Canada, hit the Missouri River, follow it to the Mississippi, and coast the rest of the way to Louisiana. When they go around those big bends on the upper Missouri, the air is left hurt and shaking. And if you are a duck hunter, the place to be is behind a rock on the cliff side of the bends because the duck's speed on the turns almost drives them into the cliffs and into your gun barrel. This is just where my father and I were. My father was in good form, and we knocked down several ducks so close to shore that we almost could have retrieved them without a dog. Then a stray came by, making such a faint vibration that he passed us before we saw him. We both fired, at least halfway across the river, but the dog had seen him and had started out. The trouble was she was used to retrieving in quiet water, and she should have run down the river bank a lot farther before starting to swim for the duck because the current carried the duck a long way before the dog caught up to it. In fact, the duck by then was nearer the other bank, so the dog gave an extra snap of her neck to set the duck securely in place, then just kept going for the other side. I have a theory, probably not subscribed to by academic geneticists, that as Chesapeake's are coded for retrieving, Scotsmen are coded for profanity. Not obscenity, just profanity. I've known quite a few Scotchmen in my time, including my father's brother, so this has to be taken at least as considered opinion. I always felt that my father lived a somewhat unnatural and unhappy life because he could not swear. But once, to my knowledge, he showed his genetic tape. He leaned with his shotgun against a rock and stood up, scaring off a big flight that had started to make the bend. But he never noticed it. Goodness, he said, which is as far as he usually descends into the abyss. Then he said, my goodness. Then he exploded. Did you see that damn dog over there? It was a hell of a long way off, but I could see that bitch lying on a sandbar with what looked like a big fat mallard between her paws. I believe that if my father thought his gun could have carried the river, he would have given the dog both barrels. After a good rest, she came swimming back without the duck. And if you're interested in things that give the appearance of being a long way off, take a good look at a duck that you have shot that's lying dead forever on the other side of the Missouri. Fortunately, the dog handled most of the rest of the ducks fairly well, but she carried four or five more across the river and left them there, which was enough to spoil the day for my father. I am glad to say, though, that the experience left no lasting marks on any of us. That evening, my Wolf Creek girl and I had several good laughs, and a little later in life, we were married and lived happily for many years. My father forgave the dog and hunted with her for a number of seasons, but always on quiet water. It might have been simpler if he trained her to recognize that he was at the center of the universe and that all things falling upon the water were to be returned to him, he being, as it were, the creator. It wouldn't have been hard. Our almost perfect duck dog was our last Chesapeake, as if genetics had arranged itself in dramatic and climactic order. She was bigger than our other dogs and more imperial. When my father started me fly fishing, there were only about a dozen flies that any trout fisherman carried with them. Plain and royal, coachman, gray hackles with red and yellow bodies, brown hackles, and my favorite, if only for its name, Queen of Waters. To me, this dog was Queen of Waters. I wish that she could have found it in her heart to return a little of that feeling I had for her. But she did not care for me particularly, or for my father, or even my mother, or ducks, or even dead ducks. She was my first encounter with a strict professional. She loved only one thing, 
She loved to do the thing she could do, which is to bring in dead ducks. She made that Missouri River look like an irrigation ditch. Sometimes, while the rest of the world lies turning in bed and counting sheep, I lie turning in bed counting the ducks she brought in for us the first day we worked with her on the Missouri. It was cold as hell and the ducks were being projected from Canada as if from a rocket base, but she missed nothing that skittered upon the water. We were hunting with two other parties, each of which had a spaniel, and by 9 o'clock in the morning, both spaniels were through. The big water and the undercurrents and the cold had finished them off. There could have been five dead ducks floating down the river and the dogs would only put a foot in the water and whine. Finally, their owners took back to the car and wrapped them in blankets. Even in the bitter cold of late afternoon shooting, the queen of waters was still retrieving the ducks for my father and me and the other two parties. It was so cold by then that long icicles hung from her brown curls. I can still hear her rushing by me for the river tinkling like a glass chandelier in a windstorm and i can go to sleep with this sound in my ears this dog was great even when she goofed actually i can remember her goofing only once and then she almost killed my father me and herself not just one or two of us the works she swung only in larger orbits this was the first season she had been shot over and we were shooting on a slough on the Black Root River. There were a good many ducks on the water when we sneaked into our blind around daybreak, and we got three of them when they rose off the water. The dog hit the slough as if she had come out of a cannon, but even so, she hadn't got the three ducks to shore before another flight circled, started to light, then saw the dog and took off before my father had a shot. This is a good slough. And for an hour or so after daybreak, there was a big movement of ducks over it. So it is not best to spend, it is not best to send your dog out on the water until the flights start easing off. Well, the queen of waters, although still but a large pup, was doing her thing. And in the process, she scared another flight that had started to settle. Finally, my father fumbled in the pockets of his hunting jacket, pulled out a long piece of stout cord, softly called her and tied her to him from her collar to his leg. Then he looked shyly at me to see if I had been watching. This slough is in the deep woods and usually you hear the ducks coming in before you see them. I didn't hear the ducks this time, but I saw the dog stiffen and I kept raising my eyes. I saw my father swing his gun to his shoulder and then I saw a duck swerve out of the flock and in a moment, you could project the duck's curve to the water. The moment you could, the dog could too, and the cord held. She started for the water like a supercharged dray horse, hauling my father's leg through the reeds. My father didn't freeze on the trigger because the gun was a semi-automatic, and if he had frozen on the trigger, he would have fired only once. Instead, he must have gone into a state of convulsion, and his gun was blazing. One shot went through the reeds, and lay down a swath as if he were mowing hay. Then he just missed me. And then he just missed the dog. And once, I'm sure he almost shot himself. It scared the hell out of me. But I live to verify the accuracy of the old Western description of a charge of a shot going past your head as busting a hole in the breeze. Shakily, I got my father unwound from the reed and the dog, and the cord, and his gun. But even before I had totally completed this operation, and certainly before I had quit shaking, I heard the spraying of water on the reeds, and there was the dog with the duck. She was a magnificent creation, and had a privilege not granted to many mortals of living long enough to approach perfection. Then, shortly after these things happened to the dog, my brother was murdered. I try to say it the way it was, without premonition, never to be explained and never to be assimilated. It had no past and it never went on and turned into something else. It just was suddenly, shockingly and forever. After the funeral, my father and mother and I spent several weeks at our cabin on the lake. It was early May and the forest floor of the cathedral of a thousand year old tamaracks was covered with dog tooth violets, which are really lilies. Around the lake, they are often called glacier lilies, probably because 
it is only about 20 miles from our lake to the glaciers. We thought they were the most beautiful and fragile flowers we would ever see. We tried not to walk on any of them. My father aged rapidly. We never hunted ducks again, and he had to give up most of his trout fishing. His feet dragged when he walked, as if his lug muscles had atrophied, so he could not fish the big rivers anymore, or even the creeks that were hard to get to. Mostly, he fished in the lake, in front of our cabin, in a flat-bottomed boat he had made many years before. If it was bright, he wore no hat, and his almost red scotch hair paled until it became part of the sunlight. If it was all cool, he wore one of my brother's fishing jackets, and soon after my brother's death, he adopted his dog. My brother's dog was a handsome Springer Spaniel called Quake, because my brother had got him as a pup in 1935, the year of the earthquake in Helena. My brother had been a fine shot with a scattergun, and Quake was a very good duck dog. Not as professional a duck dog as the Queen of Waters, but in the end, the best dog of all. This dog and my father greatly changed each other's lives. The dog and my father were inseparable, whereas before, my father cared to be with dogs only during the hunting season. As for the dog, I'm sure there are other cases like this, but he was the only dog I ever saw that became another dog for love of another man. For my brother, he had been a duck dog. And now, for my father, he became a fishing dog, if one can speak of such species. He would sit all day in the boat, in the seat next to my father, and peer into the impenetrable water. He not only loved, but admired my father greatly. I'm sure he thought the whole fishing thing was completely under my father's control, as I did when I was the dog's age and believed my father could come up with a fish whenever he was so minded. After staring a respectable length of time into the water without seeing anything but pieces of sunlight, he would bark at my father. And when my father caught a fish, the dog would lick my father's whole face, though my father still needed part of it to see how to unhook the fish. To the others in the family, the dog was something of a sacred object that had prolonged my father's life and helped to steady the rest of us. He was a fine dog, and after him, my father had no other dog. This story originally appeared in the October 1977 issue of Esquire. It appeared in the Norman McLean Reader, available now via the University of Chicago Press. Mountain Gazette thanks both the publisher and the McLean family for allowing its publication here. The Mountain Gazette Library is produced and hosted by me, John Boostar. For more, head over to mountaingazette.com slash subscribe today and pick up a subscription to the magazine. This podcast is executive produced by Mike Rogie, marketing by Austin Holt, produced by Connor Sedmack, social media by Amy Doran, and public relations by Ryan Rowe. No part of this podcast may be reproduced without written permission from Mountain Gazette and its parent company, Verb Cabin, LLC.